Welcome to the RMTC DHH April 2021 TA Live. My name is Scott Walsh and I'll be, be your host for today's event. You should know a bit about the Zoom environment before we begin. Please note that today's webinar will be captioned and can be accessed by clicking on the caption button in the Zoom menu and captions will appear along the bottom of your screen. You can also choose to view the transcript. It will show up on the side of your screen. We will also be providing interpreters for today's discussion. Thank you to our interpreters from AI Media today for your service. I would like to welcome you and take a moment and thank you for joining us today for this month's TA Live. Throughout this year, we have discussed the first seven principles of the Optimizing Outcomes Guideline. Today, we will be exploring the eighth principle of the Educational Service Guidelines. Links to the recording for today's presentation can be found on the RMTC DHH website in the Optimizing Outcomes Live Binder. The eighth principle from Optimizing Outcomes for students who are deaf or hard of hearing is access to peers and adults who are deaf and hard of hearing is critical. Children and youth need ongoing access to students like them. If students use ASL, signs, or cute speech, fluent adult, student, fluent adult and student signers with whom they can communicate effectively with are especially critical. Adult and peer role models are beneficial to self-awareness, social communication, and overall social emotional well-being. For students with IEPs, the IDA special factors requirement includes opportunities for direct communication with peers and professional personnel in the child's language and communication mode. In addition, the required Florida communication plan further supports the need for access to peers and adults. For more information on the communication plan, check out the RMTC DHH webpage. School personnel and administrators must begin by recognizing that students, families, and schools are members of a community. These support communities are stakeholders and support systems and are potentially valuable collaborators in providing educational programs for students who are deaf or hard of hearing. Schools should not function as an isolated entity. The various communities that professionals may encounter include the neighborhoods surrounding the school or program, the home communities of students and their families, ethnic and culturally based communities in which students and families reside in and are affiliated with, the communities of individuals who are deaf, the communities of individuals who are hard of hearing, the local, state, and national professional education and special education communities, and the healthcare and medical communities. The National Deaf Center published an article called Research Summarized, Leveraging Community Resources, which calls for the need to build strong social capital through community activities for students who are deaf or hard of hearing. This article is a resource for parents and educators to explore when beginning to build and support their students' community of resources. The link can be found in our live binder. Building and nurturing community influences a student, which in turn develops the beliefs melded together to create a student's individual identity. which may include many factors, including family values, tradition, last name, culture, language, religion, or even a disability. The place where these things meet is called intersectionality. In our world, identity or knowing who you truly are is such a profound part of who you'll become. This small piece plays such a critical role in all aspects of our life. From self-awareness to the ability to effectively connect and interact with others, identity ultimately brings purpose and directions to one's life. While, while identity is an abstract concept for us all, for students that are deaf or hard of hearing, it can be even more complex. With only 3% of our state's population being either deaf or hard of hearing, frequent interaction with others that are deaf or hard of hearing is rare. More than nine out of 10 children that are deaf or hard of hearing are born to hearing parents. 
when a child is born and identified as deaf or hard of hearing, this may be one of the very first interactions either of these parents have had with a person with a hearing loss. On the flip side of that coin, children who are deaf or hard of hearing born into a hearing family rarely, or in some situations, never get to act with another person who has similar experiences in life. This is often one of those skills learned early on through incidental learning. For children who are deaf or hard of hearing, self-awareness can be a difficult task to learn, especially in light of little to no interaction with people on the same journey. Culture and language automatically become the primary focus for most children who are deaf or hard of hearing. How will the child receive language? What culture will the child be raised in? How is language vital for our students to develop self-awareness? Social capital impacts self-awareness and identity. Social capital is where values and norms are shared, where people are able to network within a community for opportunities for employment, education, or collaboration. Collaboration in a community that has a common intersection I'm sorry, collaboration in a community that has common interest builds capacity. Our innate instinct as humans is to connect with others. Building relationships allow for us to feel a part of a bigger community. We do this professionally by working together with our coworkers and administrators as a team to accomplish goals and tasks. We also do this in our personal lives to develop social circles, allowing us to share and connect with people that have common interests. For our students who are deaf or hard of hearing, this community, this connection is imperative for their success. Let's take a moment and watch a segment of this video from the National Deaf Center that models the importance and impact of social capital for students who are deaf or hard of hearing. What is social capital? It's where values and norms are shared, where people are able to network within a community for opportunities for employment, education, or collaboration. Deaf people feel more capable of navigating different settings by being around other deaf people that share the same experiences, resulting in greater overall well-being, confidence, and healthy social adjustment. I saw how people responded to a variety of situations, which I was able to see because I had access to communication. That made me a more confident person. Attending YLC was amazing. Getting to see so many role models that were already college students. Some of them attended RIT, some Gallaudet, some public universities. They had already obtained their degrees and this inspired me. It motivated me even more for college. It's nice to be able to be approach or run into somebody that is also deaf blind or deaf because uh, we share the experience that we uh, all go through. If you'd like to watch the rest of this video, you can check it out in our live binder. Some of the positive impacts that result from social capital our students are able to seek out and build support systems, connect with others that have similar interests and backgrounds, develop skills from incidental learning. These skills can result in the students learning about advocacy, networking, and sharing experience. Several takeaways that are cultivated from social capital are helping individuals navigate complex school and workplace situations, increases participant buy-in, increases collaboration, and gains the trust of deaf people. It also contributes significantly to psychosocial well-being and persistence towards degree completion. For students to thrive both academically as well as socially and emotionally, communication plays a critical role. Using the student, student's primary mode of communication to effectively create an accessible environment does so much more than just provide access. By doing this, we are acknowledging the student's unique communication style while honoring them for who they are as an individual. Having access to peers and adults who are deaf or hard of hearing allows the student to be able to easily communicate with minimal barriers in place. These role models also provide 
the student with a frame of reference. Many of our students that are deaf or hard of hearing either rarely or have never met a person that has a hearing loss. Someone like them, someone that wears equipment similar to theirs, someone that uses their language. These moments and those interactions with others that are deaf and hard of hearing are profound in that they allow the student to see what life will look like past their education and into their adulthood. If I may speak personally for a moment, when you're told so many times that you can't, you can't be in the military, you're told you can't be a state trooper, you're told you can't do all of these things, you start to begin to wonder, what can you do? This is where access to peers and adults that are deaf and hard of hearing is so critical. It's moments when you get to engage with others like you that you begin to learn all the things that you are capable of doing. You can go to college, you can become a doctor, a lawyer, a nurse, or a teacher. You can get married and you can be successful. These opportunities play such a profound role for our students by shifting perspective and ultimately building identity and determination. If we frame having access to peers and adults who are deaf or hard of hearing as a form of a mentorship, we can then start defining the true impact that these experiences have. According to findings from the National Deaf Center, research has shown that deaf youth who participate in mentorship programs develop greater confidence, self-worth, and deaf identity, which can in turn build self-esteem. They also develop better social relationships, stronger independent living and coping skills, and more expressive language. With connection and building meaningful relationships at the center of these interactions, Students are able to benefit from these experiences in so many ways. These opportunities directly and incidentally begin to cultivate and foster identity. Summer camps and other curricular, extracurricular activities are opportunities to engage with peers. We are including this video from, from NDC for you to watch later if you would like to learn more about how summer camps impact students who may not have had an opportunity to impact with to interact with peers or others. Other opportunities, including deaf mentorship programs. Here are some that you can explore. You can also find more information about them in the live binder. The Florida School for the Deaf and Blind has developed a deaf mentor program providing family-centered, home-based early education, focusing on communication, language development, early literacy, and bridging deaf and hearing experiences for a culturally diverse family with children aged zero to six years of age who are deaf or hard of hearing. A partnering program that just launched, also offered by FSCB, now offers a mentorship program for students aged six and up. Sign On Friends Like Me is a new subscription service that promotes social language and peer-to-peer -peer companionship in small groups. Families can choose from three communication modes, American Sign Language, oral communication, and those that use total communication. This can provide an opportunity for deaf or hard of hearing ch children to connect with someone who is deaf or hard of hearing, similar in communication style, improve on their social skills and to make new friends. There is a tiered subscription for this service. Hands and Voices, God by Your Side is another excellent program that provides mentoring and support for families of children who are deaf or hard of hearing. The program links veteran parents of deaf and hard of hearing children with new parents, guiding and supporting families through the experiences and providing valuable insight on being a parent of a child who is either deaf or hard of hearing. Now we would like to have our panel of experts come on and share the importance of access to peers and adults. I would like to take a moment and cordially welcome Catherine Montesino, a teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing from Sumter County, Florida. Victor Nelson, a former student who graduated from Broward County, Florida. And Harry Wood, a STEM trainer with the National Technical Institute for the Deaf Regional STEM Center. Welcome. And if you guys would like to turn your cameras on now. We are gonna run through a series of questions um, and we're going to go with each, each panelist will have an opportunity to answer the question as we go from one to, I believe, about nine or 10 questions. So our first is going to be starting off directly with Catherine Montesino. 
starting off with a bit of your background, could you believe, briefly share with us a little bit about yourself? Sure. What was it like growing up being deaf or hard of hearing? What type of school did you attend? Growing up, what language did you use? And culturally, how were you raised? I'll swim first, okay. Um, you ready for me to go? Okay, okay. All right, so my parents uh, were born in Cuba and my parents taught me to speak Spanish. Um, so I'd, that'd be my first language is Spanish. So I guess culturally, I'm Cuban, but I never really fully connected with that because I was born with a hearing loss, but that hearing loss at that time was mild to moderate, and people never actually even noticed. I didn't even notice um, or recognize it myself. I thought I was stupid. I didn't know. Um, so I guess that's my experience growing up with um, having Spanish in my life, with a hearing family, with hearing sister. Um, I'm middle child. And so my older sibling is brilliant. My younger sibling is brilliant. And I just seemed like I was, I was stupid. I couldn't understand why um, until um, I had grown up and realized and now I understand um, that at that time I had a hearing loss. I mean really at that time there were no services, no IDEA, nothing like that. Um, no deaf or hard of hearing teacher, not, no services like that. I was just on my own. Scott talking. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Harry, um, the question's on to you now. Harry talking. Thank you. Um, yes, I was born deaf. Really, my hearing loss, um, if you start on the lower frequency end, um, I'd be considered moderate. And then when you go to more high frequencies, it just plummets. Um, you, they couldn't even measure it. I'm just profoundly deaf. Um, I do use hearing aids to help me with ambient noise and noise around me, but if I take the hearing aids off, I'm completely deaf. Um, I was mainstreamed in a public school with a few other um, deaf children when we were in a self-contained classroom. Um, and I had, yeah, one or two classes with within that self-contained classroom, but most of my day was spent... Um, in, I guess, the hearing classroom with hearing peers. And um, the self-contained classroom, I would go to, to get some support in like a study hour type of thing um, to support the classes that I was taking. Um, but there was deaf and hard of hearing kids around me, some who signed, I mean, really, uh, my school, if I, I think in elementary school where I was, I grew up with uh, acute speech. I mean, now it's more appropriately termed um, cued language because people hear cued speech and think that the student is learning how to talk, but really it's not that. Um, it can help um, learning spe how to speak and speech, yes, but um, yeah, it's kind of cueing the language, cued languages. So I grew up with that. Um, and then once I went to middle school, uh, three elementaries had combined into the middle school. Um, so there was more of a variety of cute speech, sign language, total communication, oralism, all within that middle school. So I interacted with more diverse students, but pretty much the same education, self-contained classroom for a period a day, um, and the rest of the day just in the um, hearing classroom. Um, and that lasted all throughout high school. Um, yeah. Culturally deaf, I don't know. I 
I, I don't I don't really consider myself that I, I I'd consider myself more on the hearing end. I am deaf, but I sign hearing on the forehead like I'm I think like a hearing person. Um, a lot of my cultural learning came later in life, meeting other deaf people, so I noticed that I've missed a lot in my upbringing. Awesome. Thank you. I'm going to turn my camera off now. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, sir. All right. First of all, I want to say that it's a pleasure being here, and... A little bit about myself is I was born in Florida, South Florida. I grew up in South Florida, Broward County my whole life. Um, I moved from neighborhood to neighborhood until I moved to this neighborhood where I am currently. Where it is where I received my better education, my higher sense of education. I was around a better group of people. So that made me came out, you know, uh, more easier to be around, if that makes sense. The reason I say that is because it was at eight years old was when I got my first set of hearing aids, first pair of hearing aids. And with that being said, long story short, I grew up in South Florida. I wasn't always in the most pleasurable of conditions so that when I did turn seven or eight years old, my mother had took me to the doctor. I didn't have insurance, so it took a very long time to find out that, hey, yes, maybe he is, maybe there is something wrong with his ears, you know, like go get it checked out. And so I was seven years old. One of my teachers had said, at Cheddar Elementary, one of them had said, I think that you can't hear. And so I was sent to Pompano Beach High School where I had received my audiological, audiological evaluation. And it was figured out, it was discovered that my, I have a cochlear de deformation in my left ear where it's not fully, where it's not fully formed correctly. So that ear, and it's not a hundred percent there in the left ear. So in my left ear, it's, it's deaf. But if something's loud enough, I can feel the vibration on my left side. And that goes from my head to my body for the left side. For the right side, it's more of middle ear infections, like at least twice a month. That makes it hard of hearing. So that's a little bit about my condition. Um, how I grew up, I grew up very cultured. My mother is from Trinidad and my father is from Haiti. And my grandmother is from Venezuela. So, hey, not only that, I grew up in mainstream schools my whole life. I had ESC classes. I had speech therapy. I had deaf and hard of hearing counseling that made everything, that, that was a great help. A very, like, no, there's no word to explain that. It's just a wonderful program in general to have on your side. Um, so I had every advantage of the ESC, being part of an ESC program and, and an IEP program. I had every advantage to say, hey, I have extra time, you know, let me use it, all that stuff. I had all that stuff. But me being the tough person that I had to become on account of me growing up where I grew up and in a cultured area, nevertheless, I never used those privileges until like around 11th grade, 12th grade. So if a, being a future graduate myself, I want to say to the high school students now that whatever privileges that you may have, just wait to cash them in until a later time. Because when college comes, it's a lot of money. Not only is it a lot of money, but it's a lot more things that you're going to want in life. So it's better if you, you know, hold on to your privileges and save them for later. Um, with that being said, I grew up with two languages, English and Creole. Never, never too much Spanish because my abuela, she didn't live to be that long. Um, with that being said, I also grew up learning Trinidadian Patois or Trinidadian Creole in my later teenage years because it has the same dialect with um, Jamaican Patois. 
That being said, I know how to speak three languages, speaking, speaking wise. Um, sign language wise, there wasn't that much option down in South Florida or that many schools that offered sign language where I was at the time. Um, Victor, I cannot thank you enough for sharing that. That was phenomenal. We're going to move on to the next question. I'm going to continue to pull some great information that you have. Uh, no thank problem. you so much for I appreciate it for being here for sharing that. That was thank you. Okay, for our second question, um, I'm going to go back to Catherine and start with her and ask. What was the first time you met someone who was either deaf or hard of hearing? And how did that moment make you feel? Um, I'll, I'll say that before I was, um, as I said, I was born with a mild to moderate hearing loss. But as time progressed, um, now I'm more on the severe to uh, profound so I'd say maybe when I was 25 or so, I met a deaf person. And my hearing loss at that time had, had dropped. So, and they said, do you sign? Or I said, do you sign? What does that mean? I don't, I don't understand because obviously I'd grown up speaking Spanish and English. And I asked a lot of questions of, how do you sign this? What does this mean? Do you talk as well? I talk as well. Um, how are you deaf? I don't get it. So I started to understand my identity. I started to understand more that I, I wasn't stupid. Um, and my sisters are brilliant, sure. Um, but not like extraordinarily brilliant. But, um, and I'm just as smart, just as brilliant. Um, because I'm older um, and there was no access when I was in school so now yeah I understand and I feel like okay so I'm the same as you I'm deaf or hard of hearing so what does that even mean so I mean I didn't even understand what deaf or hard of hearing meant or that there was a difference between the two um, I grew up with um, both worlds, um, the hearing world, and now that I'm in the deaf world, and I kind of oscillate between the two, and sometimes I feel like, who am I? I'm, I'm not really deaf. I'm not hearing. So who am I? And it, it, it's, it's not very comfortable. I mean, I'm, I'm not really comfortable in either so now having the experience of meeting multiple deaf people, um, multiple deaf people, um, seeing where everyone's at, um, noticing that deaf doesn't mean you're completely deaf, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't mean you can't talk or don't talk, deaf does not mean you have to use American Sign Language, deaf does not mean you can't, can't, can, or can, 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 or any rules. It's a huge spectrum. Now I understand that. And it's really cool. This is Scott saying thank you. Thank you very much. It's beautiful. I'm going to hand it over to Harry um, and ask that question of you. This is Harry. Um, really, I, I can't really remember the first time that I met um, a deaf person because I pretty much grew up with deaf people. Um, as I mentioned before, I was in the public school um, and that public school had a large um, deaf and hard of hearing program. So I was in one of those three elementary schools, um, had several deaf children there. Um, so for as long as I can remember, I always was around other kids my age who were deaf as well and grew up with me through middle and high school and such but the first person that really sticks out for me um, is a guy that I met in high school other people I mean deaf peers I do remember obviously but 
they're just my peers they're same as me but I guess the first person that was older than me that I thought wow cool um, and asked this person a lot of questions and thought they were a cool guy and looked up to them I want to be like him that's really neat um, I feel like we were similar in a lot of ways um, and like Catherine said um, all deaf people are obviously different I mean there's a wide diverse variety of us out there um, I guess in, these, say in terms of culture I think it's more of individual culture honestly because um, everyone has different backgrounds different hearing loss levels different upbringings and such so for really the advice that I'd say it's whatever type of person you want to become. Thank you for sharing, Harry. I really appreciate it. Victor, I'm going to transition the question on to you. Thank you. And let's see, the first time I met someone, it wasn't a someone, it was a group. I had went down to, I believe it was Ramblewood Elementary down in South Florida. And that's where I had gotten my audiology test and ears fitted for the ear mold, for the hearing aids, for the school hearing aids. And so I, they had a program there where it was a class for deaf and hard of hearing children. And I, I had seen that and I realized that, hey, I don't see that many people with hearing aids like me. They have the hearing aids that I have at my house because I hadn't began wearing hearing aids in school yet. I, I had only worn them, worn them when I was home because they were so expensive and my family paid for them. So I had, on, I had to only use them at home. I couldn't use them at school until I had gotten school hearing aids. So there was a lot of information that I missed out on when I was younger that I wish that I'd known because I would have became a little bit more public than I am today. But there's a step, there's a journey, there's everything in life, like everything has to fall in its place. With that being said, the next, the next deaf person or hard of hearing person I would hear that was in our community, which is the deaf community, would be a girl who goes by Carolina. And I believe she is two or one year younger than me. And the first time I met her was at Lion Creek. That was middle school. And I believe she's on this call. And so shout out to her. And shout out to another kid that I had also met who was in the deaf community. His name is uh, Halano, I believe. Halano, I believe. Yeah, Halano. Shout out to my boy Halano, because that's my boy. And we kind of just grew up all the way from middle school all the way to high school, but we never had the same classes because I was always the oldest. And then when I got to high school, I was in the deaf and hard of hearing community a little bit more often. So I got to go out on um, field trips, as you would say. Thanks to Miss Allison Dudich. She's my deaf and hard of hearing counselor. She's also my guardian angel because if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have all these opportunities within the deaf community that I have today. Victor, thank you. I really appreciate you sharing that with us. Thank you. All right, we are gonna move on to question three. This is gonna go for Catherine again. Have there been opportunities in your life where you've been able to serve as a deaf role model for a younger child with a similar cultural or, or linguistic identity? Wow. Oh, there are so many experiences that I have um, with me working with deaf and hard of hearing children. So I get backing up. Um, I became or an art teacher. Um, I work at the school for the deaf at St. Rita in Ohio. The school that I worked there, um, I worked as an art teacher, as I said, and oh, there's just there were so many deaf and hard of hearing children that were wonderful artists, and that's due to their eyes of what they've seen and what they can see in this world. And my class um, was so wonderful to teach; um, it was easy. Um, 
and I was able to um, walk with the children and I taught them but really really they they taught me I learned so much it was just a wonderful experience and I teach now um, deaf children I teach uh, a three-year-old young boy um, a seven-year-old um, and then another seven-year-old and and I role model to them um, I show them my hearing aids um, my speech my sign I show them how I can have fun I can play I can understand people who are hearing I can understand deaf people and socialize with all groups um, that life is great and life is beautiful and life is fun and full so I just tutor those uh, three children right now and I'm a role model to them but oh there's so many it's been great Catherine, thank you for sharing that information with us that was beautiful absolutely beautiful Harry, I'm going to pass it on to you. I, uh, opportunity to really um, be a full-on role model for children, I guess, um, for deaf and hard of hearing children. But really, I remember, I guess it was around high school time, um, I knew I wanted to become a teacher. And then as time went on and my studies furthered, I knew I wanted to teach in a deaf classroom. Um, I didn't feel that I could teach at a public school with hearing children. Um, it just didn't feel like a good match that I just couldn't do it. So I know um, I, could, I could work with deaf students. Um, and then I, I became determined uh, to become an elementary school teacher through my studies because I wanted to be well I noticed um, all of my elementary school teachers growing up I noticed most uh, were women and there's nothing wrong with that at all don't misunderstand uh, what I'm saying uh, ladies but um, I really wanted to see men I, I wondered where those male teachers were and I wanted to be one of them so I guess uh, my first year teaching um, all um, elementary school students is who I taught and the head of the school decided to do some experiment <laughs> and it obviously did not go well um, but my first year um, was fourth and fifth grade in one classroom all boys and one girl and they thought oh we'll put all the boys with you and have a role model to look up to and I'm like sure bring them on and I just didn't know what I was getting in myself into, honestly. Um, so that first year was definitely a stumbling block. And then um, obviously my classrooms have been mixed gender from then. Um, middle school and high school, I mean, it, I can really connect better um, with that age group. Yeah, middle school also, I'd say, for some reason, elementary kids, I just love them. They're great. They're cool. But really wasn't connecting with them. I developed more relationship with the older children, um, it seemed. So I've had some experience um, within the hearing school environment personally, and then I taught at a deaf school um, within that environment, and I'd say now I'm on 14 years at the deaf school that I've taught at. Um, seeing the dorm life those st that is, is there, um, deaf students who um, do the day school program and they come every day variety of backgrounds I've met of the st few of the students who um, are pretty isolated um, kind of off on their own at home um, and I can see that it's tough for those type of students um, so I just want to be there and yeah my cr in my current job I'm very fortunate to be in a position where I can um, kind of I've just met a lot of deaf students um, and kind of meet them in their journey at a variety of ages from all over the country. Um, like Catherine said, um, 
I teach, but they teach me just as much. Um, and I've just learned so much about deaf culture and how diverse it is. It's pretty amazing. I've learned a lot about myself as well. Um, pretty cool experience. Thank you. Thank you, Harry, for sharing that with us. Victor, I'm going to pass it on over to you. Oh, yes. I don't know if you guys could hear, but there's a helicopter going over right now. <laughs> no, sir, I don't believe we did, but. All right. Um, has there been opportunities? In... Hmm. I wouldn't say a younger child, because like I've said, the way I grew up in South Florida, everybody was a little bit always older than me. So um, I'm young, I'm very young. I'm, no, I'm only 19 years old, I just turned 19. With that being said, I've also met a lot of people. I've also interacted and had conversations with lots and lots of people. Soon, I would put it like this. When I got my first pair of hearing aids, I never wanted to stop hearing. Never. Like, soon as I got it, it would be in my ears. I would sleep with them. I would go in the shower with them. Everything. You name it. So, me being connected to the healing world with my hearing aids, it's like a superpower, honestly. Because I can relate to both sides of the community. And not only that. I speak more than one language. Like English wasn't my always my first language. It became like a brother or sister to my first language because I would speak both so well. With that being said, my father being that he is Haitian, we spent more time in Haitian neighborhoods down here in Florida. And so I was always around people who didn't have the opportunity. Like if they knew they were deaf, they would learn sign language. And it would be a much different sign language than you would ever encounter. Um, everybody on the street would know that sign language. Everybody would tell him, hey, you know, so-and-so. Now, this one particular person that I'm talking about was the first person who I encountered that I helped in a way. And the reason I say this is because I was young and I had hearing aids, school hearing aids, and home hearing aids. I had my I had my home in it for so long that I was about maybe 12 or 14 until I swapped them out again. With that being said, there was always this older guy. We always knew he was deaf because he would always sign. And every time he would try to talk, it would sound like a baby, <clears throat> a baby talking. And it, the reason he sounds like a baby talking is because he we know that. He grew up for so long without hearing aids or without any connection to the deaf community because he doesn't speak English and he's not in a position of where he can apply or even speak the language of English to apply for, um, for hearing aid or something or apply for the services. I think I, that there's, a, there's definitely a spectrum on both language modality and, and where it can fit on there and the very differences between speaking English and the in-depth um, linguistic pieces of ASL. And that's hard to, to bridge those two together. It's hard, it's hard to blend them. And being that I speak English, Creole, Spanish, um, Trinidad and Patois, like I speak so much speaking languages so that when time comes for me to actually learn sign language, I will be able to help be like a bridge between one or two of those languages. Like that's my ultimate goal as a person of the deaf community. Like honestly, because there's a plan that I have and it's just not, it's just, I, I think about it like this. If I'm able to be confident and be positive, even though given my situation and be a beacon of light towards others who or in the same predicament that I am in, that right there tells me that I'm doing my job. So, Victor, thank you very much. Of course, of thank course. you very much. We are going to move on to, if you could say one thing today to our audience, 
with regards to having access to peers and adults who are deaf and hard of hearing that would positively affect change in the students' lives, what would that be? I'm going to start with you, Catherine. Really? Surprise? Um, okay. You're starting with me. Really? Wow. All right. Teasing. Joking, joking. Um, okay. Um, really, um, if I guess it's one thing I would have to say to tell people, um, I would, I would need to tell the audience, um, I guess really pay attention to those children. Follow their lead. They know themselves. They know their experience. They know uh, what they want. They know things. Whether they're three or four or ten years old or twenty years old, it doesn't matter. I, I do notice often or many times um, adults want to force their views saying you need to speak or you need to sign or you need to this that or the other you need to study math you need to learn more English you need to this that so I mean the children take that and say okay and they follow their parents lead but really really pay attention and watch children and follow their guidance and see how they succeed and you both can really I guess that's it this is Scott cool thank you I really appreciate you sharing that I'm gonna hand it over to Harry yeah um I'd say do it um create opportunity for them to meet other deaf adults or anyone older than them or even someone their age um, it's funny I know one student um, in the, that I known from the past at one point he I was shocked with what he said he said he had never met an, a deaf adult before me and he said I think I thought all deaf people died at some point because I'd never met any older deaf people and I'm like wow that was really jarring it made me think about my time too of not really seeing any deaf adults and my f I'm trying to think of the first time and it, I guess it wasn't until it was a teacher in high school my senior year and I finally met another deaf adult and I'm like wow so please if you see an opportunity to create that space um, where they can meet and natural occurrence happen and they can meet and chat or whether it's spontaneous conversation or activity together or something like that that will be a wonderful experience um, and connection that that student could make so they realize they're not alone um, to create that wonderful feeling that will help a lot now please don't um, if you see a deaf person signing and go, oh, well, my, my child doesn't sign and they're only oral, just keep them away. Or flip-flop if there's a deaf person who's speaking and not signing and your child signs. It doesn't matter. There's not one type of deaf person. We have to see that um, there's a variety of deaf people and let children develop their own identity. And that will help them develop that. This is Scott. Beautiful. Thank you so much. I want to pass this question on to Victor. I am the only one in my family that's deaf and hard of hearing. So with that being said, I with high school is where I spent more time in the deaf and hard of hearing community. So with that being said, um, I went on field trips, meaning that through my deaf and hard of hearing counselor, I met other deaf and hard of hearing students. And I was able to interact with them and kind of build a little community for myself to actually be in. And from the time I built that community for myself, like in my mind, and because they say, whatever you think with your mind, it'll be projected out through your actions. 
So in my mind, I'm building this little deaf and hard of hearing community in my mind between me and the other two students that are deaf and hard of hearing in Monarch High School. So with that being said, we all have a solid type bond, which is me, Carlita, and Halano. And we all talk to each other. We're always saying hi, or we'll dap each other up, you know, or do a, which is a handshake. And every time we're going to pick up or drop off our hearing aids, you know, we'll run into each other. We'll say, hey, how you doing? With that being said, if I could say one thing to the audience now is confidence. Confidence. The reason I say that is because I always knew that once I had my hearing aids, it's going to be a part of me. I wouldn't change that. If it's helping me, why should I change that? If I have cochlear implants, which I will necessarily have to get because I have progressive hearing loss, meaning that it's from birth, and it will continue to decrease until I go further in age, meaning as I get older, my ears or the health of my ears will begin to deteriorate. So I know I'm going to have to get cochlear implants, but why should I have my hearing aid now? I have so much confidence that somebody sees my hearing aid, I'm like, hey, you like what you see? You know, you got to find your own little twist and you got to apply that twist. Okay, so what? We're part of the um the deaf community. It's a great community to be part of because now you have family. Now you have people you can relate to. Ooh, ooh. Now you have people you can actually understand what you're going through. And the reason I say that is because me, myself, I wanted to see how long I could last in the regular world without being so reliant reliant on the deaf community because I know people that will just use an excuse for anything. I'm the opposite. I try not to create excuses. That's why, that's how much confidence that I have for myself because I've been involved in a lot. I've been to a lot of places and the best thing I tell people is confidence. Once you have confidence, anything is possible. If you don't know how to do something, there's books out there. There's libraries. Learn how to do something. There's many jobs out here to do. I wanted to go in the military. That was my plan. I spent four years, four years. I dedicated four years of my life in ROTC just to go into the military right after high school because I come from a long line of military men. That being said, that dream is cut short. Victor, I think that that is really profound for our teachers out there and administrators out there to hear that if, when they're working with their students, what is the one thing that we can really work on? And that is to build confidence, build advocacy skills, build all of those things that will support our students as they're navigating these life choices in education. And I hate to cut you short, buddy, but we are just about ready to be done. And I'm so thankful that you're here today with us. Um, we're going to begin our wrap up part really quick here. So thank you to all our panelists, Catherine, Harry, and Victor. We appreciate your time and expertise on this topic. And thank you for being here with us today. We would also like to take time and thank our ASL interpreter from AI Media for providing the caption and also for um, having captions today. Next month, we will be discussing principle nine. Qualified providers are critical to the child's success on May 12th. Please be sure to fill out the Google form with any questions you may have for the panelists. The recording will be posted on the RMTC DHH website. We love hearing from you and we are happy to help in any way that we can. You can connect with us through social media like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also sign up for our newsletters. We would love to hear your comments on social media about what you learned today using hashtag RMTC DHH, hashtag RMTC DHH, TA Live or hashtag FLDEAFED. As you may know, we are a Florida Department of Education, Bureau of Exceptional Student Education discretionary project, and all of the services we are providing are at no cost to you. To continue our work, we must collect survey data to justify why our services are needed. If each of you could please complete the survey right now, we would greatly appreciate it. When we close out the Zoom, Zoom environment, um, we will, the survey, the survey will be automatically popped up um, and you'll be able to complete the survey at that point as well. 
there'll be a survey link dropped in the chat box. And again, thank you from all of us from TCDHH. We'll be closing the Zoom room now. Y'all have a great day.